Hi there. Good morning. Hi, Kristen. How are Hi, you Deepa. today? Well, good, thanks, and you? Pretty good. Hi, Deepa. Kristen, I don't believe it's number three already. <laughs> yeah, who would have believed it? Eh? Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. My name is Tom Williams. I am uh, Director for Water at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Welcome to the third webinar um, in this series, uh, Feeding a Water Stress World, How Business and Investors Are Responding. Um, these webinars are co-organized by series WBCSD and uh, WRI. Um, before we get into the content, um, just take you through some of our usual um, housekeeping notes. Um, this session uh, is being recorded. Uh, we will be sharing uh, the recording and the slides uh, with all participants uh, after today's uh, session. All participants, except for the uh, speakers and panelists, are automatically muted and videos turned off. If you do want to um, ask a question during uh, today's session, please use the Q&A function, um, which should be at the bottom of your screen, and we'll, we'll try and get to your questions as we move through this sessions. Um, one thing we're gonna do today, which is a little bit different from uh, previous webinars, is we're gonna ask um, the participants some questions as we move through today's session, really to get a bit of feedback uh, on um, some of the content and to get some um, further direction from you. So we'll be using um, Mentimeter. So uh, on your browser or on your phone, um, please go to the URL you see on the screen, www.menti.com. Uh, you'll be prompted to enter a code, uh, which is 468168. So you can uh, do this directly on your, your computer, laptop, or your mobile phone, and we'll be coming back to using Mentimeter at, at um, certain stages um, of today's session. Um, and that's where we're going to kick off. Um, so hopefully uh, you're able to get into Mentimeter and, and type in your code because we have a first um, question for you. Um, if we go to the next slide. So just to get a sense of um, who's in the virtual room, um, fairly easy question for you, I hope. Um, who do you work for? What kind of organization do you work for? Um, and this is interesting information for us because it helps to frame some of the responses um, that we'll be asking you to respond to later on in today's session. Uh, so please do go to menti.com and type in the code. We'll give this a minute or so just to collect as many responses as possible. So we've had 18 um, responses so far. The code is on the top of the screen. You should see it there, 468168. So when, once you go to menti.com, you should be prompted to enter that code, 468168. Okay, a fairly balanced audience. So we'll just wait a little while more just to bring this up to 40 or so respondents. Okay, I think we'll leave it there and it gives us a good representation um, of who's on the call. And as I said, this is also useful for the discussion we have to understand the audience, but when we ask some of the questions later, it gives us a little bit of, of framing and context to, to some of those um, responses. So please keep the menti.com um, browser open or on your phone. Uh, we'll be coming back to it later on to ask you some more questions, uh, particularly on the content of the webinars that we're covering. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So this is the final webinar in a series of three. Uh, and today we will focus on standards and collective action. Um, taking a look at uh, today's agenda uh, for the 
standards um, section, uh, we will have a kickoff presentation from uh, Sarah Wade at the Alliance for Water Stewardship um, with some contributions um, from Jens and Drew. And then we'll move into uh, our section on uh, collective action. Um, Kirsten James from Sears will moderate a discussion with um, General Mills and Sustainalytics. And this will also try and draw on some of the topics um, that we've touched on throughout the series uh, and get some reflections from, from both Jeff and, and TT. Um, and then we'll wrap up at the end. Uh, as I said, we'll have some questions for you and, and have some summary points um, to take away. Before we move into today's um, content, just a quick recap of the first two webinars. Um, so the first uh, webinar focused on two reports and, and one tool from CIRA's WBCSD and WRI. And we looked at some of the high level trends and challenges around water, um, food and risk. And we also heard from the Coca-Cola company and Actium, um, uh, an asset holding company about how they address water stewardship um, within their organizations. And these reports and tools uh, informed four priority action areas that we wanted to focus this series on. Uh, next slide, please. And the first two priority action areas were uh, disclosure and standards. So for the second webinar, uh, next slide please, uh, we looked at the Food, uh, Agriculture and Forestry Products Preparer Forum, TSFD Preparer Forum outcomes as they related to water. And we also heard from uh, Terra Alpha Investments and OLAM about the importance of di disclosure, the kinds of actions and decisions that disclosure drives, and how we need to move forward on improving disclosure around water in the food and agricultural sector. Next slide, please. The third and fourth priority action areas were sustainable farming and sourcing and, and specifically exploring how standards um, can support them. And then lastly, uh, the fourth priority action area was collective action. How do we drive impact at scale through a context-based multi-stakeholder approach? And that will be the topic um, for our final panel discussion. So let's um, move um, straight ahead with our first topic, uh, which is on standards. And what we want to explore here is the role of standards in driving more sustainable sourcing and farming practices. Uh, first, we'll look at the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard, but also discuss other agricultural and, and commodity-based standards as they relate to water, and then more broadly look at ways to incentivize sustainable farming and sourcing. Um, to kick us off and introduce us to the AWS standard, I will now hand over to Sarah Wade, who is the Strategic Program Manager at the Alliance for Water Stewardship. So Sarah, um, over to you, maybe a quick introduction to AWS um, before moving into your presentation. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Tom said, I'm Sarah. I'm the Strategic Program Manager at AWS, and I'm joining you from uh, a sunny uh, Edinburgh in Scotland today, actually. Um, the sun always shines in Scotland, though, of course, as I'm sure is well known uh, all over the world. Um, so as Tom said, I'll talk a little bit about uh, AWS today. Um, what our organization is and what we do, um, how our standard works, obviously, because we are a standard system uh, as well as a membership based organization. And then I'll talk about some of the work we're doing specifically in the agriculture sector um, before we hear a little bit more from Drew and from Jens about some of the other work that's going on in this area. So to kick us off, um, I'm going to start just by talking you through our definition of water stewardship because at AWS, we've got a specific definition that we work to. And this definition, which you can see on your screen now, was developed alongside our standard system via the same multi-stakeholder process, including civil society, the public sector, and the private sector. So we define water stewardship as the use of water that is socially and culturally equitable, environmentally sustainable, and economically beneficial, achieved through a stakeholder inclusive process that involves both site and catchment based actions. And I choose to draw this definition to your minds, first of all, so that you know the perspective that I'm coming from when I talk about stewardship, but also to help you contextualize how our standard works as well in, in the wider world. So why stewardship and not management? Well, most of you on this webinar probably already know the answer to that question, but of course, water management alone is not enough to address the world's water crisis. Site-based actions such as efficiency measures that we often hear a lot about are just not enough. Um, and I'm sure you'll know that well enough. Um, 
the classic example is you know what what use is it to make your farm super efficient if the next farmer downstream or another water user just pollutes the water instead or increases their own consumptive use to make use of the water that you've um, freed up uh, so to speak through your own efficiency gains that's where stewardship really comes in it involves taking actions on your own site so making sure you're following good and best practice um, within your own fence line to use the term that we often use in the standard system but then going beyond that to work with others in the catchment or the catchments that you rely on to address your shared water risks and challenges but also to identify potential opportunities and I've got this very basic I'll admit um, diagram of a catchment on the screen um, to help bring this to life a little bit so you can see we've got uh, a variety of different potential water users shown in our catchment from uh, industry homes farms um, and other public users of water but they're all reliant on that same water source and likely follow some similar regulations set down by the same authorities albeit also with some different regulations as well depending on what sector they're in and to make sure the water in that catchment is available for future requirements we need the whole catchment to be managed sustainably and that means all of the water users playing their part and working together not just taking actions in isolation without considering how it might impact others if you could move on to the next slide please deeper thank you um so that's the theory of water stewardship and um, why it exists at a site and catchment level but how does that translate to an organizational level obviously everyone's water stewardship journey is different but this slide that you see in front of you now sets out what the steps to good water stewardship might look like in practice it begins typically we find with someone within an organization or a team within an organization recognizing that water is a risk and that the organization has a significant impact on but also reliance on water resources from there typically we see internal cross-department conversations begin to ascertain the level of dependency on water across the activities of the organization as that internal discussion grows so too does the external conversation with um, suppliers customers and other stakeholders to build a, a true picture of the organization's water use impacts risks and opportunities and as that awareness grows across an organization steps can be taken to help begin to identify an approach to act normally this begins with a mapping exercise where direct and owned operations as well as supply chain locations and procurement link linkages are all mapped together this information is used to conduct a water risk assessment which can be undertaken using a variety of different tools um, and lots of different approaches but WBCSD and WWF along with WRI recently published a report on some of the main water risk tools that are available at the moment and I'd recommend taking a look at that if you're not sure where to start Use of these tools helps an organization situate their operations and their supply chain on water risk maps, which enables you to identify where you've got clusters of activity in water risk hotspots. And at this stage, you need to understand how the value of those water risk hotspots links to your organization. So for example, one farmer in a high water risk area might not be as important to your response plan as a whole group of farmers all clustered in one water risk hotspot. But it really depends on the value of each site and its importance to the continued operation of the business or the organization. Once you've identified your priority locations for action, sites within these locations become prime candidates for water stewardship activity and application of the AWS standard, if that's the route you choose to go down, of course. And I'll talk a bit more about our standard shortly. But a really important element of water stewardship is continual improvement. So at each stage in this journey that we've set out quite basically here, um, it's really important that implementing organizations always reflect on what they've learned so far um, and continually adjust their activities and their plans to respond to this growing knowledge base across the organization, but also through the conversations that are generated with stakeholders and others. After initial application of our standard, we're always keen to see that experience shared across the business to facilitate adoption at scale so that credible claims can be made not just at single sites but also at a more strategic level for an organization and that's the kind of site level process that we typically see people adopting when it comes to, to water stewardship 
but that process also contributes to a broader set of activities at an organisational level, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. The information can support development of a water strategy if you haven't already got one or an update to your water strategy and also a wider set of sustainability activities. Data gathered through application of the AWS standards can be used to inform other sustainability activities and initiatives such as your disclosure, um, development and reporting on science based targets and other corporate level reports. So all of that activity at a site catchment and organisational level plays an important part in responding to water challenges and opportunities and also supporting collaboration and collective action. Next slide, please. So what role does AWS play in this? Um, well, AWS is two things. Um, and you can see our standard on your screen now. But the other thing that we are is a global membership collaboration. Uh, we've got just over 135 members worldwide, and they come from business, civil society, and the public sector. And members are at the real heart of AWS. They play a vital role in our governance, and they drive forward our system around the world by making decisions, sharing knowledge and learning, and collectively advancing water stewardship practice through pre-competitive collaboration, because we all know that water is a pre-competitive issue. So these conversations need to happen way before we get to the kind of competitive level of things. And so that's the first role that AWS plays. AWS is a hub for sharing knowledge and learning from across a wide range of sectors, geographies, specialisms, and others to support the water stewardship community to continually learn and innovate in water stewardship. But secondly, of course, we are a standard system. Um, our standard was first launched in 2014, and it's evolved since then through our first official public review and revision process, which we concluded in March last year, and that's when we adopted version 2.0 of our standard. For those of you that aren't familiar, the standard is um, free to anyone to download um, and it's responsive to site and catchment context. So that means that it takes the user on a journey to understand site and catchment water risks and then act. And because of this responsiveness, it can be used by any water user anywhere in the world. Certification is an option against our standard and it's enabled through independent third party verification and that makes um, it possible for certified sites to make credible claims about their water stewardship activity. As you can see in the wheel on the center of your screen there, the standard is structured around five steps and five outcomes, and the outcomes are down the right-hand side of your screen. In each step, there are a series of criteria and indicators which a site must adhere to in order to be certified against our standard. And to support those sites, there's a general guidance document which gives advice for each criteria and indicator. And we're also in the process of developing supplemental guidance at the moment on um, topics such as WASH and also one specifically to support agricultural application of our standard. So through adoption of the standard, agricultural businesses can be assured that they are adhering to globally recognised multi-stakeholder endorsed best practice in water stewardship. And they can use a common language for all stakeholders to talk about water stewardship and know that they're referring to the same thing. And this is one of the benefits that we often hear from users of our system. It enables different parts of a business to communicate better um, about their own areas of focus and how water touches their part of the value chain. But it also helps other stakeholders see the role that they can play um, when water stewardship is adopted by any water user anywhere in the world. The standard also provides a mechanism for businesses with a shared area of interest uh, to collaborate at a pre-competitive level. And that shared area of interest could be a sector level, for example, the group working to develop our agricultural guidance, or in a common water risk hotspot where we sometimes see group and multi-site certification being used to bring a number of sites together to work together on water stewardship. Final slide, please. So to finish, I'll um, just tell you a little bit more about how this applies specifically to the agricultural sector. I mentioned at the beginning that water stewardship involves moving beyond efficiency and shifting the focus to collaboration at a site level and at a catchment level. But we can't just talk about collaboration at a site and catchment level. There needs to be collaboration at all levels of the value chain to avoid producers and other important stakeholders becoming overburdened with competing asks and demands relating to water use and impact from all their customers. 
This is particularly important in the agriculture context, where there are already a huge number of standards and initiatives which producers and others are expected to engage with. So as a standard system, we are keen to work with others to look at how we can lower the burden on producers and lower the barriers to entry for water stewardship for those who want to take part in the system. Our standard enables sites to make credible claims, as I mentioned, about their water stewardship activity, rooted in a clear understanding of their operating context, but it also provides a common understanding and a common language to facilitate collaboration at a site, catchment, organisation and a sector level. Encouragingly, we're hearing more and more about uses of the standard beyond site level certification, although of course a new site getting certified is still exciting news for us, um, but hearing about these innovative uses of the standard as well to support strategy development and organisation wide thinking is really exciting for us too. But I won't say too much about that now because I know Drew is going to talk about that a little bit shortly too. To support and encourage more collaboration in the agriculture sector on stewardship, we're doing a few different things at the moment. I've already mentioned the agricultural guidance and a lot of that has come about through our partnership with WWF and the German retailer Edeka, um, who've helped us learn and understand the agriculture sector as one of the earliest adopters um, in the European retail sector and in their agricultural supply chains. And they've um, encouraged us to look at where we can better grow in the agriculture sector and who we should be collaborating with as well. We're keen to work with other agricultural standards and, and commodity standards to better join up the dots between our systems and to create more streamlined processes for producers already working within one system to see easily what additional activities they might need to undertake in order to improve their water stewardship activities. Our most advanced area of work in this at the moment is with Global Gap, but we're also engaged via the WAPRO project with work with BCI and SRP. Um, but I know Jens will mention that shortly too, so I won't say too much more yet. So with that, I'll pause for breath. Uh, it's a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of AWS. Um, I could go on for, for hours, but I won't. Um, if you've got any questions, obviously we do have the, the chat function here and um, I'd be happy to have a follow up conversation if any of you need any more information. But with that, Tom, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, please put any questions that you have for Sarah in the Q&A box. Um, we'll try and get to them now. But let's move on to our panel discussion. Um, and I want to introduce two additional panelists. That's Drew Reynolds, um, Group Technical Director at Total Produce and Jens Hoth. Um, who is a senior advisor, uh, value chains and sustainable commodities at Helvetas. Um, so we'll stop sharing the slide and move to video. And, and um, Drew, first coming to you, Sarah, teed you up a little bit in terms of yeah. some of the work you've been doing. So, so first of all, introduce us to Total Produce and some of your experience with AWS standard and other standards and how it helps you with your water okay. strategy. Okay, Total Produce is a very large produce distributor. In the main, uh, we don't use water directly on our sites except for the normal housekeeping and hygiene. However, we have got lots of growers we work with around the world uh, and locally. And it was key for us that we, the only way we're going to do something is through collaboration. We don't really have direct control over what those growers do. Uh, we have to work with them, liaise with them. Uh, within the business, we were doing lots and lots of projects, lots of different things. And I was looking for something particularly that uh, could bring all those things together, give us a common language and a bit of a target. If you go to most growers, uh, uh, they'll say to you, we're already doing this compliance, we're already doing that type of compliance. So adding another layer of compliance onto them would be quite a burden, especially the smaller growers with limited resources. So talking to AWS, it came very clear that uh, they also had the collaborative approach. You just need to look at uh, their mission statement, ignite and nurture global and local leadership, incredible water stewardship. So we believed it had to be a, a stewardship route for us. Uh, and the best route is to try and join, try and get the industry standard, which is Global Gap, to up its game a little bit, particularly in the area of water. Yes, on our own sites, we can get to the standard that's in our control. But when you're procuring product from around the world, uh, it was key to us that we had 
uh, a goal, a target that we could bring our growers along with us on that journey. Uh, and we saw AWS, the standard, the way they were working, as I say, as a, as a, a nice common language and it's given us and the business uh, a strategic direction. And I think that, uh, that sums it up really. Great, thanks a lot for that, Drew. Um, we'll, we'll come back to you. Jens, moving over to you. Um, through some of your work with the private sector and farmers, you've promoted various standards, AWS, um, SRP, BCI, maybe you can unpack these acronyms as well, for example. Yeah. Okay. Um, what have you seen work and not work in terms of incentives um, to adopt these standards in practice? The first answer for any kind of incentive is, of course, very trivial. If you want to have a farmer being really motivated to join you, then, of course, the idea of a premium is very challenging and very tempting to him, challenging for the company. So this is an aspect that uh, we successfully implemented because actually on top of Alliance for Water Stewardship, better cotton initiative for the cotton sector, sustainable rice platform for the rice sector, we also work with uh, organic farming standards and fair trade farming standards. So we have a pretty good overview of what works and what does not work. So some of these standards really encourage a premium, others not. What can you do as an incentive to encourage farmers if you don't have a premium? It's still very interesting and motivating to him if you offer the package transparently and clearly, a package of extension, a package of further benefits that he may receive. In the case of water, most of the farmers feel the pinch of completely outdated irrigation infrastructures or missing any kind of geographical approach that Sarah explained. So water catchment approach, farmers see that they are losing and that they have to do a collective action. So any kind of a package, let it be that stewardship or let it be the approach for any extension that will capture farmers in large numbers. What does not necessarily work is the inherent value of any sustainability standard. That might be too far, that might be too complex for a farmer to see a short-term benefit. He would say, well, if there is a long-term benefit of my environmental or social engagement, that might be true, but I don't know what's going to happen in the next year, whether I still can make my crop. So short-term benefits are actually depending, of course, on the area where you work. But if you work with small farmers, you have to give short-term answers. Great, thanks Jens. And we've touched on you know, the business perspective for standards and farmers as well. And Sarah, maybe coming to you to, to pick up another stakeholder group. We're here talking about broadly investors and business and um, water stewardship. Are you seeing any pickup um, in interest from financiers or investors in, in the AWS standard? Mm. It's a good question, Tom. Um, not as much as I'd like to see would be the, the honest answer here. Um, I think worryingly we still hear a lot of conversations about water footprinting being the approach that people are endorsing, um, taking a very kind of measurement focused approach. Um, and, and that's a challenge for us. I think the water stewardship community is um, increasingly trying to engage with the investment community and with the kind of ESG groups to help them understand why stewardship, why not management, um, and, and why it needs to be rooted in context and why you can't necessarily find a single metric that can be applied across a whole business when it's got a plethora of different uh, operations and supply chains that it's dealing with. So I think there's, there's more of a, um, of a kind of learning and an education work to be done in the investment community to help them understand what role standards and stewardship can play. Um, because although AWS is growing massively, we're still not you know, rolled out at uh, hundreds of thousands of sites kind of scale. So I think investors in a way are waiting for that point before they can use it as a decision-making tool um, as they do with things like CDP disclosure. Um, so I think we've still got quite a long way to go with the kind of finance and institutional investor side of things. But where we are seeing good um, uptake is in um, development finance institutions. So um, we've got a lot of our work in Latin America has come about through a partnership with uh, DEG, the German Development Finance Corporation and FMO, their Dutch equivalents, um, who've invested 
quite significantly in AWS in Latin America over a multi-year period to enable us to grow our regional network there. Um, and they've done that because they invest in agricultural producers in the region and they know that those producers need credible, robust water stewardship to enable them to be sustainable and exist into the future. So by investing in AWS and enabling us to grow our network there, we're able to provide on the ground support to a range of farmers um, in a number of countries. At the moment, our focus is Peru, Colombia, and Ecuador, um, purely because of where our members have their interests, uh, but we're looking to grow that as well into the future. So it's really quite a mixed bag, Tom, to be honest, in answer to your question. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, we're, we're running tight on time, so I do have uh, two questions um, I want to uh, ask just before we close. One for Drew and then, then one for Jens. Drew, we had a question coming in from one of the attendees which was talking about when you've got such a, a broader range of countries that you need to deal with. I mean, Total Produce has a footprint in in a number of different countries. How do you sort of manage this complexity? Well, Sarah touched on it. Uh, it's all down to starting with your risk assessment, finding your hotspots, then finding where your farms, your growers sit within those hotspots and then starting to get them to understand the catchment that they're in and the water usage on that farm. So from a practical point of view, we've got them doing water management plans for that farm, but with the water stewardship, we've got them thinking wider, what other resources are in that area and where are they taking them from? What's the balance? And that's the real bit that's added to us and helped us with our strategy. Just, uh, just asking a small grower to, to do that is quite difficult. And uh, there was another question I noticed about resources. You know, as a business, we do try and help our growers uh, by providing on the ground resources. Uh, and that's how you start at the very beginning with asking them questions, asking them what they do, how they do it. We've probably been doing that type of work for a long time. What's this is helping us. It's given us a target and it's given us a, a wider understanding of uh, where the water is coming from. And yeah, the many, many people you have to connect with, uh, which, which in some countries is massive and uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. So asking one organization or one company to do that on their own uh, is nigh on impossible. Hence why you need the collaboration. Great, thanks, Drew. And, and Jens, I want to leave the last word for this section to you. Um, our next section is going to look at collective action. So maybe you could, you could tee us up a little bit for that. So from, from your experience, how do we address sustainable sourcing and farming practice with, within a collective action context? What do you think is important? Yeah. Um, actually, from experience, we have found three levels of collective action and all of them are equally important. And then it depends a little bit on the detailed sector where you want to operate and also a little bit on the geographical setup. So the first level is a little bit that what uh, Sarah already addressed, the geographical area, the water catchment actually requires the collective action of all water users, which in the case that you are having your growers there, mostly are the ones who also shape the overall water consumption in that very geographical area, probably very, very much. But there might be also other very dominant water users as well. So there's a collective action to be established. That's the core work, why it is water stewardship, as Sarah nicely explained. But moreover, one can, and we were very surprised to see, even collective action for the financement of renovation of irrigation infrastructures. You know, most of the countries, particular South Asia, particular North Africa have completely outdated irrigation infrastructures. So they really need refurbishment to actually feed the future. So this can be done even with private sector investments. We were surprised to see that because we were fearing it is a, some kind of finger pointing. You are the guys that should invest. No, we managed a quarter, quarter, quarter split, public sector, international donor, public sector, local government, 25% farmers, 25% from the involved company. So that's a nice collective action for financing. Ultimately, third level, on the international level, it has to be a collective action. It has to be a partnership between private sector, public sector, international donors, and also 
probably NGOs as such as us from Helvetas to help to come to a conclusion how to address the priority points, how to address the hotspots. But this webinar is actually a good example for that kind of collective action. Thanks. Thanks so much for those closing remarks, Jens. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Drew. Um, we'll answer some of the questions we didn't get to uh, post-workshop, but we'll close this section now. And I'd like to um, request the slides um, are brought back on the, sh on the screen and I'll hand over to uh, Kirsten James from Sears, who will take us through the next panel discussion. Kirsten. Great, thank you, Tom. And good morning, everyone from the West Coast of the United States. Um, You've set us up very well. Um, obviously, uh, the importance of collective action was uh, woven throughout the opening uh, panel. So now we're gonna take a little time and dive into this topic um, a bit more and discuss how you know, these collaborative context relevant actions really are such a key component of managing water risk across the food value chain. Um, so who better to speak to that um, than our colleagues from General Mills and Sustainalytics who have orchestrated a number of collective action efforts and um, in fact are often held up as examples to emulate. So really excited to have uh, you here today and we hope um, the conversation will really leave participants with some new insights into the challenges and lessons learned from these various collaborative efforts. Um, so with that, I'd like to ask the panelists to just provide a brief self-introduction um, so, Titi, um, I'll hand it over to you first. And Thank you, Kirsten. You. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be talking to you about uh, one of my favorite topics and uh, the exciting things that we are doing on this front. So just by way of brief introduction, in case um, now the participants know Sustainalytics, we are the largest pure play investment research and ratings firm dedicated to responsible investment and ESG research. We have over 25 years of experience in this field and um, 16 offices worldwide and over 600 professional staff. And uh, apart from research and ratings, what we also do is engagement, which is where I come in. For us, engagement is uh, obviously what we're talking about today here. Collective action is about creative long-term investment value through constructive dialogues and partnership approach, where the idea is that both the investors and the companies, but also the broader market and communities benefit from the improvements that these activities help um, in, in getting ESG better incorporated in business practices. And as for me, I've been working with gross responsible investment and engagement for over 10 years, and I'm responsible for coordinating systematic thematic engagements. And uh, these are proactive, collaborative, SDG-aligned three-year engagements, where we are focusing on various ESG topics, which are business relevant, and also uh, important for, for tackling global challenges and important for investors as well. And as you can guess, one such topic is water. And uh, on that, we finished our first thematic engagement last summer and started the second one in February this year. And I've been responsible for developing and running these projects and have been working on water stewardship prior to that as well. So I'm very pleased to get a chance to talk about this a little bit more today. Um, I just wanted to comment on what Sarah said earlier about investors not having always completely understood the difference between water management and water stewardship and the importance of the latter. I completely agree that more education is definitely useful and I'm, I'm on it and I'm super glad that uh, Alliance for Water Stewardship and the organizers of this webinar are so too because there is so much unused potential I think that investors can bring into this conversation to really help advance the ESG issues, not least water. But I'm also happy to say that the water themes that we run have been very popular and appreciated by our investor clients. So I'm happy to report that the interest is definitely there in order to learn and do more about water among the investors. Terrific. And I can echo that sentiment from Siri's work with investors as well. So we'll get into that more. Um, and Jeff, over to you. Can you share a little bit about yourself? Hey everybody, uh, thanks for inviting me to join today. Uh, yeah, I work for General Mills. Uh, General Mills is, I don't know, the sixth or seventh largest food company in the world. Um, we market a uh, hundred different brands of products in a hundred different countries. So lots of different types of products, uh, usually locally made for the most part when, they, when you say country. Um, 
I've been at the company for almost 21 years. I've spent most of my career working in our uh, safety and environmental function in our manufacturing organization. Uh, and then once we started to you know, elevate sustainability in the company, we created a corporate function and now I'm a member of that. And so I work on uh, our climate ambition and our water stewardship ambition and our packaging ambition. And you know, as most of you know, um, climate change tends to show up in water uh, first. And so we still, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of work to be done just on the water risk uh, front uh, in terms of business risks associated with water. And you know, like I said, where climate, climate change starts to show up. So I'm excited to be here and uh, talk a little bit about things we have going on. Great, well, thank you both for being here. So Jeff, I'm gonna um, first hand it over to you. So, um, you know, I was reading your um, 2020 Global Responsibility Report recently, which was, I believe, released a couple months ago. And the report really reflects on progress, but also, of course, looks to the future. We're starting off a new decade here. Um, so looking to the future um, at the macro level, how does collective action fit into this vision and plans moving forward on water stewardship? And you know, what does General Mills really have in mind as your next set of goals and milestones to that end? Yeah, sure. As, you know, as, as we look forward, uh, you know, out the next 10 years or so, we're really starting to think uh, less about sustainability and more about regeneration. And so that's kind of a buzzword that's gone around at, at General Mills. But just basically trying to communicate internally, for sure, as well as externally, that just sustaining is not enough in, in, in the world right now. We, we need to regenerate. And that really is clear in, in places that have high water risk, right? And so, you know, if you've got high water risk, chances are it's already too late to sustain and we gotta get things back to where they were. And that's really what regeneration is, is all about. And it's really about just not working on doing less bad and doing more good. And, and so, but we can't do that alone. Uh, you know, most of our impact, whether it's water or climate, it, it, it is not in our own control. It's not in our four walls. You know, we heard it earlier, um, you know, when we talked, when, when Drew talked uh, about, you know, we, we don't control farmers. We just can work with farmers. We can ask them to do things and show them a better way. And that's really where we're focused uh, in trying to, to work collective ag action in agriculture uh, you know, with farmers and farmer groups and really on training and showing them the way. Uh, at General Mills, you know, we've, we've, like I said, still focused on water risk and we identify those places in the world uh, where water risk exists in our supply chain. So either it could impact our business or our business, you know, sourcing or located in that area could impact water risk. And so we want to make sure that we understand where those places are and then, you know, and then go to work. And as you, most of you know, you know, it's not like climate where you can, you know, do something in, in your own hometown and have an effect, you know, for the earth. You have to go to those places. So that's one of the biggest challenges with water is you have to pick a place because you can't work everywhere. You just cannot. And so you have to pick a place and, the, and being a really big company, there's a lot of places we could pick, right? And so, so we have to do that uh, in some sort of a, a you know focused process, and so we use water risk assessment tools like uh, Aqueduct or the water risk filter from WWF uh, to try to identify those places, and then we dig in. Uh, so that's a really our first step. The second step is to understanding what the problem is and who's working on it. And so we immediately move from what's the problem and where's the collective action. And if collective action doesn't exist, we make an attempt to create it. Uh, and, and that's a challenge, right? If, especially if you're not there, if it's, uh, if it's across several oceans, whatever, it's, it's a challenge. But, but we've had some success with that. And we lean on, on NGO partners and other companies to do that. And, and so um, I'll stop there and, and talk more about collective action in a minute. But. Great. So TT, you know, Jeff obviously highlighted picking a place is important. And we've heard just throughout this series of webinars how important the local context is um, in stewarding water. So with that in mind, can you talk a little bit more about um, what Sustainalytics is working on in terms of your localized collective engagement with investors, 
Um, you know, what was the tra trajectory that led Sustainalytics to pursue this approach? I know you mentioned you just concluded an, an agriculture focused engagement recently. So I'm guessing that that work was informative to the new effort, but if you can just share a little bit more about that. Sure, happy to. So yeah, indeed, the, the new localized water management engagement that we've started builds on the learnings from our first thematic water engagement that ran from 2016 to 2019. And like you said, the agriculture and food sector was one of the focus sectors for that engagement. And in terms of the localized approach, obviously apart from us knowing that the exact water risks and the impacts vary tremendously depending on the location but also the dialogues and the research that we carried out during the first project they so clearly demonstrated that companies have started to acknowledge that as well many explicitly recognize that the collaboration and the basin level efforts are the most effective and and cost cost efficient as well uh, ways to, to tackle water risks but even with this recognition they remain the areas where management responses have yet to be fully actualized apart from some leading companies obviously and uh, this was also illustrated by the kpi one of the kpis that we had for the first water theme which was focused on the integrated water resources management and we saw that during the during the engagement period the targeted companies fared poorest but also made least progress on this particular kpi so this obviously led us to think that this is an area which, if, it, if it's so important and if it's the best way to tackle water risks, and at the same time is the area where not much or not nearly enough is being done, then that obviously seems to be an area where we should focus on in our next water engagement and really try and, again, bring the investors into the, into the dialogues and help use the leverage that investors may have to, to move companies and stakeholders from recognition to action in this field. And we really felt like this is where engagement could have an impact. Um, so, so then what we, what we did with this current engagement project is, is build a combination of a localized approach and also encouraging this integrated collaborative responses, which, which we just heard that General Mills has also acknowledged as, as being the way forward. And the way that we are doing this now is that we are focusing on two locations to really hone in on the impacts and opportunities in a specific place. Again, as Jeff was saying, like there are so many places where you could be doing things on water and much varies on, on, the, on the specifics uh, in terms of physical, uh, physical risks, but also the local infrastructure and, and regulation. But what we've done uh, after analyzing uh, various alternatives is that we decided to focus on the Tiete Basin in Brazil and the Val in South Africa. And, uh, and then we focused or, or we've selected 10 companies in each to really uh, to speak both on the local level, but also try and understand from the companies, how are they experiencing the realities? What are they doing? What are the opportunities for collaborative action? What are other stakeholders in the locations doing? And how can we really bring everyone together in honing in on, on these particular um, shared risks and, um, and potential for doing something together in these particular basins? Terrific. It's great to see investors engaging with you in such a strategic way. Um, that's terrific. So Jeff, I've had the pleasure of working with you on several collective action efforts. Um, you were a founding signatory about, I think, five years ago now um, for our series Connect the Drops Public Policy Collective Action in California. Um, and then you're also, of course, a part of the series WWF Eggwater Challenge, which is a cohort of nine companies working with us to protect freshwater in their egg supply chains, which I'll put in a quick plug that um, Ceres and WWF will be launching a 2020 focus for the challenge imminently. So everyone should stay tuned on that. Um, and of course, you're a very active member um, in many other um, collaborative efforts, the California Water Action Collaborative, many others. Um, so how do you see these efforts and maybe some others that you want to flag as really fitting in strategically with your work. You sort of touched on that at, at the uh, front of the discussion, but you know, what are some of the examples of the progress you've seen with, with some of these initiatives? Sure, um, and I, I would say you know, for, the, for the companies um, or you know, the folks that are working on water risk uh, that are looking for collective action, one of the best things you can do is tell the world about those places that you're focused on. And, you know, so just like Titi did, she just said, well, here's what we're focused on, these two places, which invites collective action, invites people to your door asking questions. Um, it also, from a company standpoint, gives you, I won't say the right, but gives you the opportunity to, to redirect folks that want to talk about their 
their pet watershed and say, well, here's really what the ones that I have to focus on. Um, so in terms of collective action, I'll, I'll first I'll give uh, Sarah uh, some kudos and AWS. Uh, you know, AWS is, is a great, great start for any uh, place or facility to get moving on collective action because it requires you to step outside of your own four walls and focus on, you know, shared water risks with others in a catchment. And it, it really does get things moving. Um, and we've even seen some folks in the Midwest here, uh, one particular dairy farm that's applied it and it just is moving a dairy farm to worry about other people's concerns uh, outside of their own, uh, you know, plot. So it's, it's very helpful. Uh, you know, in what we've seen with as far as collective action, probably the, the model example that I'll share, and I, I just Have I been talking the whole time and you guys couldn't hear me? Nope, you just went on mute, so you're all good. Now, how about now? Yep, you're good. Good, okay. Um, I just want to... Um, so one of the collective actions that we've found that uh, you know is a great way to get involved if it if it fits is a water fund, and so the the Nature Conservancy has 41 established water funds around the world and just about that many in development, and it's an easy way to get involved in water stewardship uh, without having to do all the work, and that's what collective action is all about, right? And so probably the best model for us has been our, um, our water risk in the Rio Grande uh, watershed where we have a manufacturing facility in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We don't source a lot from that particular watershed, but we have a lot of water risk. We've got a big cereal and snack plant in Albuquerque that if we lost water uh, services to that plant, it would be significant impact on our business. Um, and so in getting involved in the Rio Grande Water Fund has made it easy for us to work in the forest and really try to, the, the ultimate goal of that water fund is to eliminate catastrophic forest fires. And so we don't know anything about eliminating catastrophic forest fire, but we know how to participate in collective action and tell people about how great this organization is. And so, and, and so collective action is just not about collective action, it's about collective funding, which is really important as well, because not one company can afford to fund all the work that that needs to go on. So in that particular water fund, the Rio Grande Water Fund, it, you know, there's several organizations that kick in either in-kind uh, efforts, uh, such as labor and work, uh, you know, on the mountains, et cetera, or folks that are just providing uh, fiduciary support, like us. And and so we're also, you know, working with the community on on uh, you know various things that we can do with uh, harvesting rainwater and things like that, and and, and education about water, but that's one of the, the best examples. Another one is our, our involvement in the California Water Action Collaborative. And so a water fund really isn't an option in California for a whole litany of reasons, but there's already enough uh, collaborations or uh, levels of uh, governmental agencies in California where there's, there's a, quite a bit of structure that already is in place. And it's just a matter of focusing uh, groups and focusing that to work on it. Uh, and so the California Water Action Collaborative is just a group of NGOs and, um, and companies. It, it started as all food and beverage companies, but now we have the likes of Google and Microsoft and Target in this group that are really focused on the same thing. How do we improve the water from source to sea? You know, the, water, the watershed from source to sea. And so we have forest projects going on, we have agriculture and, and urban water reduction projects going on, and then we have restoration, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the tidal zones going on. And different groups, different uh, companies and NGOs in that collaborative work on it. And so not every company is involved in every single thing or every NGO, but we're all related to it, if you know what I mean. And we all hear about it and see the value of it. And so that, you know, that's another one that's really great. But then, you know, we go to, to, to somewhere like India where we've identified water risk in our wheat supply chain and the average farm size is 10 acres. Uh, there's a lot of farmers and we're trying to figure out how do we impact all, you know, you know impact or enroll all of those farmers in, in that, 
that part of the world. And so there, again, we're looking at a water fund there, which, which they call the water trust, um, but just to enroll various folks, including the government. Terrific, great examples, Jeff. Um, so we're running short on time, but I did wanna uh, circle back to that uh, question earlier and, and comment about really the importance of getting institutional investors more engaged. And TT, obviously you've had some good luck with your engagements. And you know, I'll mention that um, Series is really diving into this, the importance of this work as well. Um, we recently launched what we're calling a Valuing Water Finance Task Force, which is comprised of about a dozen asset owners and banks. Um, and really what this group is doing is it is hoping um, to drive corporate action and really strengthen the business case for water leadership. So our hope is that um, as an outcome of this work, investors will be positioned to engage more effectively with companies. So um, stay tuned on that, but hopefully um, that will bring some, some good change. Um, so quickly, TT, in that vein, you know, in your work, what has really resonated the most with investors in making water a relevant topic and motivating um, them to engage with you? And, um, you know, how are we gonna get more investor voices to the table? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's many things and uh, it, different investors maybe have different mandates and different priorities, but I, I'd say that one, one thing is definitely SDGs. I think that's coming up more and more in conversation and, and questions from investors and obviously with water, SDG 6 in particular, but also water as a connector is, is such a big factor in, in uh, achieving improvements in other SDGs as well. So I think that's, uh, that's kind of one, one good way of reaching or making broad impact through, um, through focusing on a specific issue. But I think also, as, as we've touched on this call already as well, that climate change is dominating the agenda largely. And um, I think many investors feel that even though it's super important, of course, but it shouldn't be at the expense of other pressing global challenges as well, and material business risks such as water. So, and this is something where there is still time and opportunity to, pre to prevent the most disastrous outcomes as well, rather than trying to fix the problems afterwards. So. I think water is a kind of a rewarding topic in that sense that it's so concrete and it's everyone gets it, everyone needs it, um, that it's, it's, it's easy to communicate and uh, easy to understand what is it that you can do and what's in your power and sphere of influence there. But also generally, I think uh, investors are increasingly interested in playing an active role in effective change and, and becoming part of the solutions and not just as financiers and, and as seen as money bags, but really trying to pay, bring their voice into these discussions. So I think it's this kind of engagement, collaborative, collaborative uh, collective action approach is really resonating in itself with many investors. Uh, and with water, even though it's such a local issue, but I think for universal investors with global varied portfolios, it is important for them to encourage companies and other stakeholders to start making these changes. And even if you make them in one location, anyone who's involved in that location can then take those learnings and take to another location. So even though it's it's kind of more challenging in a way than climate change, because as, as we've established today, it is so specific to a certain place, but still every place and every learning and every project can be used as a springboard to replicate the similar kind of best practices in other locations. So mm -hmm. I think that's what investors are also seeing as interesting new model of uh, engaging on a certain topic. Great, terrific, great points. Well, unfortunately we have to leave it at that, um, but thank you both so much for your insights and for joining us today. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Tom to close us out, so thank you. Great, thank you very much, Kirsten. And once again, a really insightful um, panel discussion. I think with all our panel discussions, we could have gone on um, a lot longer, but uh, we want to keep these uh, webinars within the hour. Um, just to close off and, and to summarize, we want to gather um, your inputs to get a sense of what you have taken away from these sessions and also some of your priorities for, for moving forward. Um, so please go back to Mentimeter. So that's uh, www.menti.com. The code you need to use is 468168. Uh, so uh, open your browser, open your phone, and, and go to menti.com. Um, the first question uh, we have is we've covered these four priority areas uh, disclosure, target standards, and collective action. Um, what do you think is the most important area for us to focus our efforts on? Already some responses coming in and we'll try and get to about of a third of participants responding on, on each of these questions before we move on to the next one. So keep them coming in. Um, what in your view is the most 
important priority area that we've covered. Excellent. I think it's no surprise, perhaps, that collective action, because it really um, galvanizes efforts in the other areas as well, it really underscores all of these other priority action areas. Maybe it's also a reflection that uh, the two leading uh, topics are the ones that we covered today. Okay, excellent. Great feedback. Let's move on to um, our next question. We just need to switch to slide, so bear with us for a second. So reflecting on collective action, it was great that we got some um, clear consensus there that it was an important priority. So now focusing on some of the key enabling factors for collective action, and we heard about some of these from the presentations um, and the discussion earlier. So what do you think is the most important uh, enabling factor to make collection action successful? So again, we'll wait to, uh, we have about a third of responses in to uh, move on to the next question. So please put in your response. Finance seems to be taking a lead. Capacity building coming in second, not many saying technology. Excellent, great. I think we'll stop this question there. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next question. So these next two questions are word clouds. So they're open-ended questions uh, for you to um, type in a, a word, a phrase, something um, that's on your mind. So the organizers of this session series, WBCSC and WRI, um, what can we do more of um, to support the business and investor um, community and mobilize them for food and agricultural water stewardship? So what do we need to do to support and mobilize the business and investor community? Is it capacity development? Is it framework development, uh, developing tools, et cetera? What do we need to do? Excellent, less sharing lessons learned, engage with SMEs, proof points, education, best practices, pre-competitive platforms, pilot collaborations, and this will all be um, really useful inputs as um, we reflect on the webinars and how we could potentially collaborate and move this work forward. Let me just scroll down on some of these. Okay, I see our education coming up a few times. Green bonds. Education again tools. Excellent. All right, good. Um, let's move on then to our final question. And again, this final question is, is uh, open ended. So um, type in what's on your mind. So we've heard about some tools some reports, um, some challenges, opportunities, etc. Um, what maybe would you like to see for future webinars, um, topics, tools, um, targeted stakeholder groups that you think is important for us to focus on. So if we were to um, have another webinar, what would you want the focus to be to, to dive a little bit deeper into that particular issue, that tool or that stakeholder group? We heard about some of the, um, the risk tools, um, Okay, water quality credits coming in. We heard about the, um, the water funds from Jeff just now, as well as one example. Um, we've heard a lot about farmers, glad to see that coming up. Um, looking at emerging markets, interesting. Investors, biodiversity. And as you know, with these word clouds, the, the larger the, um, the word appears, it means somebody's put it in more than once. Excellent. Okay, she insurance and technologies, climate change, leading practices. Excellent. Okay, 
I think we'll leave it there, but these um, have been really useful inputs for us um, and give us an opportunity to reflect on some of the, the main lessons that you've taken away and, and some of the priorities um, that you're interested in, in maybe addressing in the future. Um, so it remains for me to thank um, all of our speakers and panelists um, for today and over the last two webinars and also for all the participants, particularly those that have stuck with us over these three um, webinars and for choosing to spend some time with us. Hopefully you've, you've taken something useful away. Uh, please keep in touch um, and we look forward to connecting with you in the future. We'll be sharing the slides and the recording uh, in the next couple of days. So thank you again to today's speakers and panelists and we hope to be in touch soon. Thank you.